So my background is in engineering. Actually, I did uh, an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at McGill. And uh, after, after that, uh, and a master's actually, uh, where I started to become interested in a little bit in biological processes, possibly biomedical engineering. Uh, after having worked at Seagram's for some time in, in uh, learning how to make whiskey, I uh, decided to go back to school uh, to study environmental science and engineering at Stanford uh, University where I learned a lot about bioremediation and my current area of research is still in, in bioremediation. So the success that I've had has come has stemmed largely from the fact that after I finished my PhD, in order to find out whether bioremediation was really being applied in industry and, and what were the challenges to using it more widely in industry, I went and worked actually uh, in consulting. So for I spent three years, uh, essentially in lieu of doing a postdoc, I worked in, in the environmental consulting field. And uh, subsequently when I returned to academia, I had these fantastic links with industry from that time I had worked there. And so we started working on some projects together, primarily on these chlorinated solvents, which turn to, are the most prevalent organic contaminants, uh, and collected dirt from many contaminated sites and started exploring the microbial processes that we could find within these samples. And because of you know, the ongoing dialogue with industry, when we sort of had our eureka moment, which was, oh my goodness, these microorganisms can do this really effectively, there was a receptor right away who was able to say, oh, you know, I think this is a good idea, and together, and particularly I credit my colleague in industry, uh, Dave Major from, from Geosyntec, who had the idea that, no, you know, I think we can make a business out of this. I think the, the regulatory hurdles uh, uh, were really, first of all, not exactly knowing what we needed to provide to uh, meet the regulatory, uh, or to meet, uh, uh, to get approval for these these uh, for these microorganisms to be used in bioremediation. Uh, there was also very significant differences between different jurisdictions. So in the U.S., the the permission to use uh, microbial inoculant was is is based on whether or not it's genetically engineered, whether or not it's a natural consortium or something that you've artificially created. And because this was a natural consortium, the the it was quite easy in the U.S. to get approval at many places once you prove that there are no pathogens, you know, uh, you know, very obvious pathogens anyway. In Canada, there was a much more systematic kind of evaluation that uh, was a little naive, I would say, about the science behind it and, the, and the, uh, what is known about microbial communities in particular because the regulations were tailored towards single products, uh, pure cultures, very defined. And so uh, part of the challenge was really educating the people at Environment Canada and Health Canada about the challenges of growing and, and characterizing a mixed microbial inoculum but at the same time that a mixed microbial inoculum could be a very risk-free kind of endeavor for, um, uh, for remediation because it's very much following the natural process. Yep. So the, the, uh, the regulatory framework under, in, in which a, an owner in Canada has to operate uh, really, uh, they are under the gun to show that they can clean up in the fastest period of time down to drinking water standards in a very, and, 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 uh, and, and a very short time frame and for the least amount of money. And it's not really conducive to uh, use of, of bioremediation that probably takes a little bit longer. You know, you may not clean up the water perfectly, perfectly, uh, or the clean up the ground perfectly, but you're certainly doing it at much lower cost, much less disruptive, and you, and you are destroying the contaminants with bioremediation as opposed to, say, digging it up and hauling it away to a landfill where all you've done is move them to somewhere else and the problem is delayed. And, and so the sort of short-sightedness of the way the regu regulations are framed in Canada is for owners and, uh, of, of contaminated land to have to deal with this really quickly and in a very um, absolute kind of way has precluded the use of bioremediation in a lot of instances even though it's ongoing at many sites and actually can be a really effective low-cost remedy option and uh, when we're faced with so many different contaminated sites to deal with one needs to prioritize them better to those that are really presenting health risks and, and ecological risks um, should be addressed very aggressively and those that aren't can, can, um, can be addressed with more uh, passive technologies including bioremediation. Oh my goodness, the opportunities, this is the era of microbiology right now. And, uh, and with the new technologies for genome sequencing and, and, and next generation sequencing, 
uh, it's really opening up um, a box into this, this they open up the black box of microbial diversity. And, and I think that the opportunities are, are endless. It's like, it's really a, a really fun time to be in microbiology. Uh, we can find uh, novel traits, novel genes, novel microorganisms much more easily. Uh, we don't need to cultivate them in pure culture. We're appreciating now that you can actually study communities of microorganisms as they exist in the environment. And the tools that are being developed are allowing us to do that.